So go ahead and get Isaiah 57, verse 15. Isaiah 57 and verse 15, that will be our main text. You could throw something there. We won't go there many times, but we will return here at the end of the study. Isaiah 57 and verse 15, this is the lone reference of the word eternity in your King James Bible. Isaiah 57, and we will look here at verse 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is Holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. For I will not contend forever, neither will I always be wroth, neither will I be always wroth. For the spirit should fail before me and the souls which I have made. So we find out, what do we find out about eternity there? Well, we all know eternity, right? A, 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 a huge amount of time. Um, if we were to look at Webster's definition, I believe he has, uh, his definition is um, without, without beginning or end, right? That's one of his definitions. But that one doesn't apply here, right? Because uh, the, 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 the universe did have a creation, right? It was created at some point. But there's another definition that does work. And his other definition there um, is just uh, 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 continuing and proceeding on forever continuing and proceeding on forever, right? And so that one does fit the, the universe that we will be going into um, there. So, uh, yeah, yeah, heaven and eternity, right? So well, let, let's grab some of these verses. So we got Isaiah 57, uh, verse 15 and 16. So what do we see there? Um, that eternity is also a place. E eternity is somewhere that you can inhabit. Eternity isn't just a, a time zone, but we know that, of course, right? Because when we tell somebody well, where we're at, we usually tell them... Uh, when we are as well, right? Uh, if, if I say I'm at the church, but it's on Thursday, I'm at the church next Wednesday. You know what I mean? So I'm not there on Thursday when I told you. I have to tell you a time and a place because we live in the fourth dimensional space time, right? A space and a time, right? And I moved and in the time it took me, I moved this space and this whole dimension which I inhabit is the space time, right? So Okay, uh, in God's home, there is what? What, what? what are some things we get about it? Well, it's high and it's holy, right? What do we see here? For thus saith, verse 15, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth in her eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in a high and holy place. A high and holy place. So eternity is also a place. So some things about this place. It's high and it's holy. We'll examine that in a moment. But some other things about it. There is time dilation. There is time dilation. If you remember Pastor Kim's study, um, that there's something about when you get to this place uh, out in eternity that time stops. Or time seems to not act, uh, uh, behave the same way that we see it here. And so we can see that here in a few places. Go ahead and get Revelation 1 and 2 Peter 3. Revelation chapter 1 and 2 Peter chapter 3. So we're going to be looking here uh, a little bit about God's home and the time dilation that's going on there, right? So just meaning that time is, time is behaving a little differently here than, um, than in some other places. So Revelation 1 and then uh, also get 2 Peter 3. We'll start here in Revelation 1. Revelation 1 here, the Bible says Revelation 1. We will look at verse 10, Revelation 1, verse 10. Look at verse 9 for context's sake. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So this is where he physically is. John is physically on the earth in the island of Patmos. Verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard... Behind me, a great voice as a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega. And we know here, right, this is where, look at verse 19. Well, he sees Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ talks to him. And what are the things he tells him? Verse 19, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. And so wherever John goes, and he, he say, you see, he says, in the spirit, on the Lord's day. So what we teach here is that he was in the spirit. He was in his spiritual. He's in his spirit, and he's transported to the day of the Lord in the future, the day of the Lord, which is the second advent, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Right. So it all lines up here, and that's and, and this is also here at the rapture. And so get Revelation four. Also get Revelation four real quick. 
Revelation 4. I know this is kind of a big thing and I'm going through it quick, but you should have learned all of this already. We went through this uh, about two years ago at a uh, blowout. Two years ago at a blowout. Amen. See how you remember this. Right. Time dilation. We talked a little bit about this. So Revelation chapter 4. We'll read here verse 2, Revelation chapter 4, verse 2. We're going to skip around just so you can see the context of what I'm saying here. Revelation chapter 4, verse 2, you'll see here in verse 1, the door opened. Uh, Paul, uh, uh, John sees that, the door opened, says, come up hither. Verse 2, and immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set on the throne. So now... John is in the spirit and he's up in heaven and he's on a day when some things are happening. So let's look at some of those things that are happening here. So that's 4-2. Look at 5-1. Look at chapter 5, verse 1, Revelation 5-1. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. So we see the seals start popping off here and then go to verse 11. Go to verse 11, chapter 5, verse 11. So he's transported into a day when the seals start getting opened. So he's transported to the beginning of the tribulation when the seals are about to get started, started getting opened. And then verse 11. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the numbers of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Amen, right? Amen. That's why I always get excited when we sing that song, Worthy is a Lamb, because we're going to sing that one day for real. But anyways, right? So, so what happens? Here, what we just saw here in Revelation, John, somebody from the past, was in his spirit, put into the future, and in the future, he saw what we haven't even seen yet in the future that's going to start off the tribulation. And also, while he's there, he sees th thousands and th thousands of people together who were saved by the blood of the Lamb singing a song, Worthy is the Lamb. John was transported into the future when he went up to heaven. When he went up and he, the door opened, the door in heaven opened and said, Come up hither. Uh, 4 1, he goes up, and while he's up there, he sees the Christians, the saved Christians at the start of the tribulation. Okay, 2 Peter 3 8. 2 Peter 3 8, we'll look here at this one. And this one's just a little more plain of the same exact thing that I've been saying. This little bit more plain that there is something about when you go with God, where God is at, time behaves differently. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. So here's something that, that we shouldn't be ignorant of. Paul, fisherman, fisherman's telling you don't be ignorant. That one day with the Lord, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So time behaves different when you get with God. So this is an eternal place. Now let's look at Revelation 21. Let's look at that eternal state of the new heaven and the new earth. Right, because we wouldn't say that those are eternal places because they are going to get created one day. So they're not without... They're not without beginning and end. Revelation 22, and we'll look here. We'll look at 21, 21 verse 1. 21 verse 1. Revelation 21 verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And remember, this is right off the 20, verse 11 to 15. This is right off the cusp of the great white throne judgment. Right, off, right after the great white throne judgment. And whosoever was not found written in the book of the life was cast into the lake of fire. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth from, uh, from, from the first heaven. And for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying behold the tabernacle of men is the tabernacle of God is with men amen that's good and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them that's very similar to what we read in Isaiah 58 right Isaiah 58 so very similar to what we read there Isaiah 57, uh, I mean, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Let's uh, continue. skip here to verse 22. Skip here to verse 22. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city has no need of a sun, neither of, a mo of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did light in it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day. For there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of, of the nations into it. 
verse 22, verse 1, and, uh, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb in the midst of the street of it. And on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruits every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healings of the nation. And go back to chapter 20. Go back to chapter 20 and verse 10. Chapter 20 and verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Day and night forever and ever. So here where God is at now, there's time dilation there. And there, you know, there's something going on. But, but in the future earth, in the future heaven, maybe in New Jerusalem. So yeah, in that city, there is no sun or moon. Right? There is no sun or moon in that city. But as for on the earth, as for on the earth, there still is day and nights. There still is months. There still is the passage of time. There still is the passage of time. Because at New Jerusalem, from what we understand, New Jerusalem will come down to the earth. And at certain times of the month, at certain, you know, certain months, people will come in. Come in through a certain gate. And they'll go to that tree. And they'll partake of that tree. And that's how they'll get eternal life. In the, uh, in the going into eternity. So there's day and night. There's still months going on, um, but it's at an eternal state. It's going to keep going on forever, right? We don't have to worry about the new creation, the new heaven and the new earth uh, being destroyed and all of that falling into entropy. And, and I'll, I'll go into that as we go along, but um, we could just take it as a given here. It's an eternal state. There's no more death, no more sorrow, no more nothing like that, and, and the world's going to keep expanding. Okay, so... so Let's keep going here. Let's keep, let's keep going. We've set it out. There's two definitions of eternity. There's one that's outside of time where God is now. And there's one where we're going to be going here in the future that's going to have time applied to it, but it's just going to keep going on forever. It's just going to keep going on forever. So let's look here back. At, let's go back to Isaiah 58. What did we learn about that place? That it was high and holy. It was high and holy. So we took it as a granted here. That it was, it was uh, you know, up in heaven. But we're just going to prove that real quick. High and holy. And uh, also because it's going to segue us into talking about light. So um, go to uh, Psalm 73. Go to Psalm 73. Psalms chapter 73. We'll start here. Psalms chapter 73. Okay, Psalms chapter 73, and let me see where this, da, 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 da. one second, sorry, 75, 75, 75, verse 6, 75 and verse 6. Psalms chapter 75 and verse 6, for promotion cometh neither from the east, nor the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. So what do we see here? We have east, south, west, God. Yeah. God put there for north. Yeah. Right? God put there for north. Um, we also see that, and we won't, we won't run through these other references, but go ahead and write them down here. So how, how do we know that, that, that there's a pyramid shape of the universe? Well, we're, we're, told, in, uh, we're told that... that um, the, the frame of the universe, right, is, is something that can have a capstone and a cornerstone, and they can be the same exact thing. And the only shape that can have the corner to be its head just so happens to be um, this pyramid here, right? This pyramid here. So, so how, how can we be sure of that? I'll, I'll give you some verses here. Um, sorry, let me just pull this up. So verses here, Isaiah 28, 16. Isaiah 28, 16. And 1 Peter 2. Six and seven. Go ahead and just put those down for your part here. That that was the capstone, right? So that's how we know there's a capstone here. And the corner has become the head. The corner will become the head. And the only thing that the corner can become a head is this here, the triangle, which is then going to become the, the uh, pyramid here. So, so why did I go through all of this? Well, because the capstone, it's separated, right? The cap, you could take the cap off. Which fits perfect is what we're seeing here is because God's home is high and it's, it's not just high, it's not just north, it's holy. Which means what? Which means set apart from, for God, set apart for God's use. 
This place is holy. It's separated. And what do we see? What, what do we know about it? Well, there's a sea of glass that separates. There's a sea of glass that separates. And I know this is all very base stuff, but we'll start going a little deeper here. Okay, so, so we're going to run through a few verses. So let's get 1 John and James. 1 John and the book of James. 1 John, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So God is light. So where God is at here, this holy place, God is light. There's no darkness. So here, there has to be some light there. James 1, 17. James chapter 1, verse 17, the Bible says here, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Interesting here. Let's keep running these. Um, Psalms 104.2. Psalms 104.2. What we're going to see here is God's relation with light. God's relation with light. And so the reason we're going to start connecting God with light here is because we're going to find that God, that light and time actually go together. Light and time actually go together. What did I say we're going? We're going to the book of Psalms. And we're going to Psalms 104. Psalms chapter 104. So you want to go ahead and read it out? Read it out, brother. Psalms 104, verse 2. Who covereth thyself with light as with a garment, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. He covers himself with light. Light is a covering for God. Light is a covering for God. Let's look here. Uh, Daniel chapter 2, verse 22, kind of same thing. Uh, that God dwells with light. God dwells with light. Isaiah 45, verse 7, and Jeremiah 4. Isaiah 45 and Jeremiah 4. Isaiah 45 and Jeremiah 4. Okay, Isaiah chapter 45, we'll start there. Isaiah chapter 45, and we'll read verse 7. Isaiah chapter 45, and verse 7, the Bible says, Isaiah 45, 7, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Right? I, the Lord, do all these things. You see, God, what does God do? God doesn't just dwell with light. He doesn't just cover himself with light. But the Bible says here that he forms light. He forms light. Right, so another thing. Uh, form can also mean um, not just created and made, but it can be uh, you know uh, setting the bounds to and things like that. Right, forming it. Uh, and then Jeremiah four, Jeremiah four twenty three, Jeremiah chapter four, and verse twenty three, Jeremiah chapter four and verse twenty three. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. Yeah. So we see a connection here with light and form, light and form. So keep that in mind because we'll talk about that here in just a moment. Light and, just, light and form in just a moment. So Genesis 1.1. So we're talking here about all this light stuff. We know that John 1 would also take us to light, that, um, to, I mean, to, uh, to the Word, the Word of God. And also the Word was light, right? And the Word was the life and all of that. So connecting light and life and the Word and all of that here. So let's look at Genesis 1. Let's go to creation then. Let's go to, well, we don't even have to go there. Genesis 1. Look at this. Look at this. In the beginning... Now we have an establishment of time. In the beginning, God created heaven, space, and the earth. So here in the beginning of our Bible, in the beginning of our, of our book, we have, we have something that, that science can't even get a hold of. Right? You know what I mean? Like our book doesn't start off with philosophy and religion. Our book starts off with the creation of all life. Our book starts off where the scientists are trying to get every day. You know what I mean? Man, praise God. Look at that. I, got, I, got, uh, I want to read this, this little note here from, um, this is uh, the Henry Moore Study Bible. Good, a good, good study Bible I use. He's a creationist, but for my creationist stuff and for like, uh, you know, geological stuff and for workings of the earth, I like using the brother's notes. He has a lot of word, notes about that stuff. But I want to read some to you, right? So here he says, uh, this is about Genesis 1.1. No other co cosmogony, whether in ancient paganism or modern naturalism, even mentions the absolute origin of the universe. All begin with the space-time matter universe, already existing in a, prime e in a primeval state of chaos. Then attempt to speculate how it might have evolved into its present form. Modern evolutionists begin with the 
elementary particles of matter evolving out of nothing in a big bang and then developing through natural forces into complex systems. Pagan pantheism also begins with elementary matter in various forms evolving into complex systems by the forces of nature personified as different gods and goddesses. But very significantly, very significantly, the concept of the special creation of the universe of space and time itself is found nowhere in all religion or philosophy, ancient or modern, except in Genesis 1.1. Man, that's good, right? Appropriately, therefore, this verse records the, the creation of space, the heavens, of time in the beginning, and of matter, the earth. The tri-universe, the space-time matter uh, universe, which co constitutes our physical environment. The creator of this tri-universe is the triune God, the Elohim, right? Our God, the Godhead, right? So our Bible starts off in places where, where they can't even, they, you know what I mean? Like, they, they want to go there, the infinite time. Why? Because you get the infinite time? Well, infinite time and forgetting about entropy, right? They always do, right? They do that number when they talk to you about it, right? But the, inf the infinite time, you, oh, the monkeys will write the Shakespeare, you know? You know, right? And, and it gets me excited because, you know what? We're going to a place where we really are going to have infinite time. I was telling the brethren, like, we, when, imagine when we get up in future, we could say, all right, you know, for the next hundred years, you know, you're the king, you're the battler, you're, and we're just going to play this out. We're going to have giant wars, and we can't get hurt anyways, you know what I mean? Send the cannons! Send the cannons! You know what I mean? We're going to have fun. You know what I mean? And, and what was even cool about it, brother, brother Hilton Smith was like, well, you know what, Brother Robert? I never thought about that. <laughs> I, that's not the way I think about eternity. But you know what? Our God is so great that, and, and where we're going is so splendid and, and there's so much possibilities that, yeah, that may be a possibility, brother. You know what I mean? Because it's not sinful. I'm not saying we're going to go out there killing, you know what I mean? But we can recreate stuff. We, can, we have infinite time. We, I, don't, I don't think we're going we're gonna to be infected by entropy because we're not going to be a closed system. We're going to have the, the, God of, the God of all energy and creation, you know what I mean, personally interacting with us. So I just get excited about it because you, well, all the things they want to do, they can't get a hold of. But you obey God, God will just give you all of that stuff. Okay, infinite time, infinite infantry, infinite, you know, getting away from entropy, all of that. Infinite infantry, we might have infinite infantry, amen. Hey, bless God, but you know what I mean? Don't worry about it. Just go have fun. Have fun. Okay, so I, got, man, I don't even know why I got off of that. Amen, though. Amen. Okay, okay. so right, we, we see the space-time matter, the, the, the tri-universe for the, the triune God. And then what's cool also, in, in, in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, we have God, develop, God establishing uh, the time construct, the construct of time, that as we use it, as we use it. Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Um, go there. Genesis chapter 1. And the earth was without form, chapter 1, verse 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Right? So, oh, oh, oh. Uh, and God saw the light, that it was good, and do God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. So God already establishes, and you'll know he doesn't create the earth, or he doesn't create the sun and the, the moon until verse, um, da -da 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 -da, and he put the signs. So verse, verse 14, he doesn't create the sun and the moon until verse 14. So before the sun and the moon, God already creates the dark, uh, the, the dark and the light, the light and the dark. And so he says what? The light is day and the dark is night, right? And this is all happening, what? Underwater. This is all happening underwater. And so before, you know, before the sun and the moon and all of that, before the, the, the sun coming around, God had already worked out that, hey, the day is, is daytime, or the light is daytime and the night is nighttime. He probably even worked out that God knew the 12 hours of time and the 12 hours here and 12 hours there. I would say he even worked it out that far because uh, we know that, uh, um, I think it was in the book of John, the Lord Jesus Christ said that we know that there's 12 hours in a day. Exactly, exactly. So the Lord said, we know there's 12 hours in a day. And why? Because that's the 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Jewish setup, right? The 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Okay, and why is this even possible before the sun? Well, that's because of sonoluminescence. Sonoluminescence. So you guys have probably seen this YouTube video, but they actually had another a guy recreate it um, at home. And so for some reason, when you have a, when you have a, 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 a closed system of water, 
and you send uh, strong enough uh, sound waves in there, the sound waves will go in there and they will clash against each other and the sound waves clash against each other will exponentially grow in power and so much so that in just a short, a short sound wave being sent into a, a closed system of water can create the power of a sun. For a split second, you know, huge, huge flash of light. You know what I mean? And they've recreated this. Scientists don't know why, but it's called sonoluminescence. Sonoluminescence. You can look up some of the little videos. They're kind of cool, right? But, but something about a sound wave, a voice. Uh, let there be light. Let there be. Uh, the vocal cord, the vibration of it going into the water causes light, right? God's working within what we see in this realm already. He's working within this universe. I thought that was kind of cool. And then, so let's talk about that missing day. Let's talk about that missing day. So get Isaiah uh, 38 in one hand and Joshua chapter 10 in the other hand. Isaiah 38 in one hand and John, um, John, uh, uh, Joshua chapter 10 in the other hand. So we're going to talk about here is, is when, um, when God manipulated time by having what? The, the same construct he developed the day and the night, God manipulated time by manipulating the, the, the passage of day and night. Joshua 10. We'll start off in Joshua 10. Joshua chapter 10. Joshua chapter 10. And verse, where should we start for context sake? Uh, verse 12. Then spake Joshua to the Lord. Joshua chapter 10, verse 12. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand, son, stand, thou, son, stand thou still upon Gibeon. And that's so weird having just, Son, hey, you, Son, stand still. And thou, Moon, hey, you, Moon, in the valley of Ajahn, stay there. And the sun stood still. And the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemy. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. For the Lord fought for Israel. The Lord fought for Israel. So we have here uh, the missing day. So. Yeah, about a day, right? About a day there is missing. Um, go, and then go to, go, to, uh, go to Isaiah 38. That's the other passage. Isaiah 38. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Go to, go to Isaiah 38 and I'll go to... Well, read it. Read it. No, I think that's just a reiteration of what we're talking about. Yeah, I'm not even going to mention that. <laughs> okay, it's Isaiah 38. Isaiah 38. And we will look at verse... Isaiah 38, and we will look at verse 8. By Isaiah 38 and verse 8. Behold, Isaiah 38 and verse 8. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees which has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz. Ten degrees backwards. So the sun returned ten degrees, by which degrees it was gone down. So we see then God also uh, manipulated time there. He made time go backwards by ten degrees. Ten degrees for a 12-hour period is about 40 minutes. Ten degrees over a 12-hour 12 12-hour 12 day period for a sundial is about 40 minutes. So what do you have? Almost a day. You have about a day in Joshua, and you have 40 minutes over here. So what does that make you think? Well, it was probably about 23 hours and 20 minutes over in Joshua. And for conservation of entropy, for conservation of entropy, if God's going to be working in the system, which he could always change how he works in the system, but if he's going to keep the, 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 the laws that he's made the system by, then, yeah, we have that 40 minutes that matches up, and there's one whole day lost, one whole day lost, right? And it just so happens that we don't need fables, right? Remember this, we never need fables or science to make us believe our Bible, because our Bible is a firsthand eyewitness account of the things that we're talking about. That's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with firsthand eyewitness accounts. So we don't have to worry about going to the fables or going to science, okay? But fables also support this. We have the Homeric hymn to Athena. The hymn to Athena, page 169, we find that the Greeks 
wrote down a day when the sun stood still. The sun stopped for a while. Quote, the sun stopped for a while. The cults of the Greek states, page 169. You also have a, fra a phrase from early Greece. The sun stopped in its course. Plato's, Plato's um, book Timaeus from 360 B.C., it tells where of an Egyptian man who comes to Plato and tells Plato, hey, you know about this day when the sun stood still. And Plato says, what? And he says, yeah, you know about it in the form of a myth about Helios, who every day Helios would take his father's chariot and he would ride his father's chariot, but he could not get it to the full length of the, of the, of the, uh, of the day. And so sometimes he would uh, ride it over and over. And this myth that the Greeks have is the, is the, the historical truth of what we Egyptians experienced when there was what, quote, a declination of the bodies moving in the heavens around the earth. They stopped moving. <laughs> the Egyptians, can't you tell where the, the Egyptians, their Bibles, right? The NIV, they, they talk like the NIV, the NASV. They talk like the, like the, the, the college crowd. You know what I mean? They talk, they talk like these guys. Uh, the Egyptian archives... Um, of uh, uh, the Egyptian archives of history of Herodotus, um, which is found uh, in a book of called a book called Boyd or a book by Boyd. It's called the World Bible Handbook, page one twenty two. It also records a day when the Egyptians noticed that the sun stopped moving. The Aztecs in fourteen hundred B C. They have it written down that the sun did not rise for a whole day, and you could find that in a. a, a uh, volume called Creation Moments, Volume 19. And there's many, many, many more, many, many more fables that support this, this idea that um, at some point the, the, the earth stood still. And so there's a story. There's a story that maybe some of you have seen on, 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 on um, social media where back in like the 60s, there was an article came out and they said, oh, NASA has, um, there was a day where NASA, they were, they were hanging out and they were studying something and they're trying to figure out how the, the stars were working and they couldn't figure out this one thing and then this guy in the back was like, oh, the reason you can't figure out because the Bible says that there's a day missing. And they're like, what? And then they all get together and then they're all together and they're like, oh man, we just proved the Bible at NASA. That was this whole story, right? And it went on social media and it blew up. Turns out, right, that was actually fake. It's, it's actually, um, um, a story from like 1690, from 1690 of another man talking um, about a similar, uh, a similar situation of understanding the stars. And he explains to him the same thing, that the Bible shows that there's a day gone and all of that. So it was just a misinterpretation. However, however, the reason I bring this up, because when NASA made the Snopes, when NASA put out their, their, their video saying, or, you know, their little article saying, blah, 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 we don't support this, that this, this YouTube or this social media uh, claim is false, right? When they put out their Snopes, what did NASA say? NASA said, NASA didn't come out and say, oh, it's fake. They said, no, we don't think God did it. There's actually two ways within our understanding of physics that that could actually happen. And uh, I, I didn't write it down. But, they, but NASA's response was, hey, actually, no, that could happen. We just don't think God would do it if God did it. Right? And so that's what NASA, ha NASA said. I bring this up because most people, they'll hear that story and they'll say, oh, well, we can't use it to prove. No, no, no. NASA proved what we needed them to prove. All we needed them to prove was that it's, it's perfectly able. And we didn't need them to prove anything. But if we're gonna, if we're gonna have, well, you know what I mean. I'll step on the back of science every day. If the, I'll step on the back of science. If it's not bad, it's not compromised, it's not sin, and I'll step up there. I don't mind. I don't mind. Amen. I don't mind. Okay. Um, the missing day. The missing day. There. So, so we see that light and time kind of go together, and God's the one that established that that connection with light and time. There. God's the one that established that that connection there with light and time. So. Okay, so then let's talk about light and time a little bit. We have the theory of relativity. So I won't go too deep into this because actually the more I studied the theory of relativity uh, and, then, and then read Doc's book, the more I got to hold the doc, what Doc was trying to say in here, the less, the less I believe this thing. And the less I believe this thing, the less cool the study was. So I was like, ah! <laughs> so I was like, all right, well, I'm going to just stop there. And then, and then maybe when I have a better grasp on what exactly Doc is saying, then maybe I'll do the, his study at a different time here. Um, but but stereo, uh, if we're going based on the theory of relativity, then here, right? Light, when there's nothing in space, right? This, this purple line is space. You guys see this? This purple line is space. There is nothing going on in space. There's no planets. There's nothing weighing it down. So light can just travel freely. But if there's a planet here, 
The planet will, when, when the planet hits space, it stretches space out and makes stretch and make this little curve. And so now when light travels within space, because it comes near this planet, it gets caught into the curvature of space created by the mass of the planet. Okay, right? Not too hard to follow. I, I hope this is as, as simple as possible. So, so the closer you are to, a, the obje to an object with heavy mass, the less fast you're going. Hence why here on Earth, because we're closer to an object of a giant mass, it, time moves slower than if we were to get into a, a, air, uh, I mean a, a, a rocket ship, go outside of Earth, fly around the orbit a few times, and land. That person would have experienced time uh, faster than we have, so we would have aged more, right? Because the, they would have experienced more time while we experienced it slower, so by the time we got to the same point, we got there at a slower time, which means we had entropy act upon us longer, which means we look older. <laughs> yeah, this is, that's why this whole entropy thing and aging and time, and all that was messing my whole, my whole head up. So I, I want to read a quick excerpt, quick excerpt from, uh, from Doc. And, and so the, the, final, the final nail in the coffin, not the final nail in the coffin, but one of the biggest nail in the coffin that just was like, oh man, I don't think this theory of relativity thing is right, is because of this. This thing here. This thing here. Of all things. Of all things to mess up the theory of relativity for me. That God is north. That God sits in the sides of the north. Brother, how does that mess up theory of relativity? Because the theory of relativity, it's not, it's not just about the relativity of, of light and time, but also with, I mean, of, of light and space and all of that, but time is going to get drawn into it. And, so, and, and time is also going to get brought into what you're positioning, time and space. And so you're positioning, if your positioning is unknown, then you can never know relatively what is north, east, south, and west. And so I'll, I'll read you a quick excerpt of this real quick. quick uh, so so this, is, uh, this, is where, uh, this is where Einstein had gotten following his logical conclusions. Suppose that at a certain instant everything in the cosmos began to move at a slower speed. Hold the phone. It can't be at a certain instant, for nothing is instantaneously simultaneous, or a faster speed, or perhaps altogether stops for a few million years, then starts up again. What would the change be perceivable? So someone asked Einstein this. If everything, everything, the whole universe at one time, let's go faster, or let's slow down, or let's stop. Uniformity, right? If relativity is true, right? If the only reason, if the, so, okay, maybe I'll, uh, it doesn't look like you guys are following. So if you're in a ship, you're in a ship, the only way I can know the speed of my ship is to look at something externally. When you're driving in a car, I can see how fast I pass that, I can, I pass that tree, I know my speed. But if I can't see anything outside of me, I'm in the middle of the ocean, I have no reference points. I don't know if I'm moving or if I'm not moving, right? And that makes sense for us. That's the theory of relativity uh, in, in a way that observationally makes sense for us, right? But when you apply it to the macro scale, that's where it begins to, make, to not make sense. Why? Because here, look what he says then. Look, if everything is completely relative on the macro huge scale, look what then follows. And what does God say? Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Einstein's official answer to that question, answering for the whole loony bin. That's what Doc says. <laughs> He's giving the answer for the whole loony bin. No. There is no experiment by which a change could be detected. In fact, to say that there was a change or that a change had occurred would be meaningless. <laughs> so Doc says, this is Doc's responses. So one, no one in the solar system or on Earth would have to make any experience, experiment to notice a change. According to all the laws of physics and astronomy now believed, every loose thing on, on this earth, including the oceans, would be slung off this earth by centrifugal force if at, if at a certain instant the earth stopped rotating. Three, if the earth slowed down and going around the sun, over half of it would be in pitch black night. Who would need an experiment performed to notice that change after that they had been sitting in pitch black darkness for, say, 120 hours? Four, are you crackpots looking, looking us dumb rednecks right in the face and telling us that we wouldn't notice if time between sunrise and sunset was increased by two hours? What 
what experiment would we need to show that there had been a change? Five, these poor brainwashed idiots are telling you that if the rotation of the earth sped up everything in the cosmos, you wouldn't be aware of the fact that you were living 500 years instead of three score and ten. They are f further telling you that if the earth went around the sun at 100 times the speed it now does, you wouldn't notice that you didn't have time to grow anything. The four growing months in Ohio and Michigan May to August would be reduced to six days. To say that a change had occurred would be meaningless, would it? Right? If everything is completely relative, then everything changes to nothing changed. Then nothing changed. No, something changed. Right. Something changed. Just like Doc said, the whole thing speeds up. Well, now we don't got six months to plant our crops. We got six days to plant our crops. Let's get them in. Let's get them out. You know, the whole world stops. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, that's what they teach us, right? It's spinning and all of that, right? Right, so I, I just thought it's thought it good how Doc breaks it up. And the last little thing I'll, I'll read from Doc here. If there was a planet, and so this is, this is the final thing. This is the final thing that, that, that got me here. And now I'll read this part. If there was a planet, how would you know which way was up when there was no top or bottom to space? As a wise joker said one time, space has no top or bottom. As a matter of fact, it is completely bottomless at the top and at the bottom. Can Alpha Draconis be seen from interstellar space? Was Albert Einstein ever in interstellar space to see if he could see Alpha Draconis? Alpha Draconis is not a planet. It is a sun. The Holy Bible substituted the word north for the word God in Psalms 75, 6 and told you that if any of you could tell the difference between the top of the mountain and the bottom of the mountain, Einstein didn't know that either. You knew that the top was north. That's what God said. God said if you can tell what the top of a bottom is, a top of a mountain is versus the bottom of the mountain is, you can know where the top of the universe is. That's what God said. But not if relativity is true. Thus, any fool without finishing fourth grade, four grades in elementary school, could pick up a dime store compass and tell you where the top was. 2 Corinthians 12, 1 to 4. Einstein was a deceived fool. John was caught. Up, Revelation 4, 1. Enoch was caught up, Hebrews 11. Elijah went up, 2 Kings 2. Christ went up twice, John 20, 17, Acts 1, 10. Before Christopher Columbus discovered America, why would you think they were dumber than Planck, Mach, Holtz, Lorentz, or Einstein? All right, so. Yeah, talking about this... Relativity thing. I just want to tear it up before, you know, I know we're putting some, some footing on this thing, but I never want you guys to think that I'm putting foot on science and I'm trusting the thing. You know what I mean? I'll stand there where I can and if it falls, well, it's all right. I didn't need your footing anyways. I got good footing here on the Bible, but you know what I mean? But I was just using a little leg up, but no, my foundation's here. I'm not, no, there's no instability. It's all right, you know? Okay, uh, so where should we move next here, Rob? Where are we going next? So the missing day. Let's move into entropy. So we've talked about this. So, so I'm thinking about this, right? I'm thinking about this. So where, where, God go, where God is now, how is it possible that there's no entropy there? And where we're going to go, how is it possible that there's no entropy there? Entropy, uh, just literally like the heat transfer effect going from hot to cold. The, the effect of heat transfer. The effect of heat transfer, right? Not, not complicated. Disorder, right? Moving away from order, right? And, and why? Because if the Big Bang was true, if everything in the universe was all compiled into one little point, it's a lot of order. Imagine you take all of your socks, you take all of your socks and you put them in your sock drawer. Now I know with certainty every one of my socks is in this drawer. But then, boom, life happens, right? Life starts, the Big Bang starts, your socks are everywhere, right? The socks go everywhere. And so, right, at the, at the point of Big Bang from there on, the socks spread, and as you go further in time, the disorder and the chaos from the initial blow, you know, the initial blast gets wider and wider, right? It's buckshot approach, right? You, you, you take a bird shot and you blow it up. You, you take a shot, if I shot the shotgun right here, it'd be, you know, if I shot it a little further back, you know, if I get all the way back, you know, until, you know, and I'm, I'm all the way across the room and I shoot it and there's dots there and there's dots everywhere, right? Because as it goes out, as time goes on, you get more disorder. You get more disorder and more chaos and the energy goes away and it becomes colder. 
And this is the law. So I, I found another name for the, for the law of second, uh, thermodynamics, the, the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy, that makes me understand it a little better. It's a law to govern the direction of a process. Why? Because I never understood the point of entropy is to determine the direction of a process. The point of entropy is to determine the direction of a process. How? Because when we have, when we have a system, there is, energy is neither created nor destroyed. If we have a cup of coffee and, and 10 joules of energy are leaving it, right? And we we, we take this, this formula right here, the, the, the change in entropy in the universe equals the change in entropy of the system plus the change in entropy of the surroundings, right? So as the system changes, the surroundings need to change equal and opposite. Why? Because the universe always needs to increase or stay at zero. Why? Because there should always be more disorder. There should always be getting colder. There should be the dissipation of energy, not energy being added into it, right? Because that's part of the definition of being in a, in a closed system here, right? And another interesting thing, so as we're just covering this, this whole topic of entropy, just to start off, I thought, I think the Bible word for this, entropy, or I think the Bible phrase for this is the process of time. Why? Why, why do you think that? Because what is this? Literally, it's the direction of process. The process of time, the furthering of time. What is the furthering of time? Entropy. As time goes on, the destruction of the, the falling away, the process of time. The, 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 the acting upon, the, the, the being acted upon of by time. What is it? The falling apart, the getting older, the growing colder, the, the, the you know, my, my, my ice cream's melting, you know, the energy going away from it. The process of time. Why? Because it pops. the phrase pops up five times in the Bible. What's that the number of? Yeah. Grace. Yeah, amen. <laughs> uh, we are at the number of death. Who does it pop up with? It pops up in Cain. In the process of time, Cain brought a sacrifice. Woo! He about to kill his brother. In the process of time, Pharaoh dies, and another Pharaoh comes in who knew not about Jacob, or knew not about Joseph. In the process of time, Judah's wife died. In the process of time, the Ammonites went to war with Israel. In the process of time, Jehoram got sick and his, and his belly fell out, his guts fell out. And so what do you see in all of, these, all of these verses about the entropy of time? You see the destruction. You see the disorder. You see the falling into chaos, falling into death, right? The dissipation of energy, right? You see destruction. You see all of these things here. Process of time, very similar to what we see going on here with entropy, the scientific word, the, bi the biblical phrase. Um, okay, so, so, so how? So how then? How then? Well, let's look at this then. Let's look at this real quick. So the new creation, Revelation 21. Go to Revelation 21. How can the new creation be eternal? How can the new creation go on forever? You know what I mean? Like, why won't, why won't it fall into entropy, right? Like the new heaven and the new earth, why won't it get destroyed? Because, why? Revelation 21. Revelation 21, 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. So that's what we're talking about, the new creation. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Boom! That's why. Why? Because this isn't a closed system anymore. This isn't a closed system anymore. You know, the, that's, that's supposed to be energy. <laughs> this be, the energy, the, the, father, the father of lights, the God of all everything. You know what I mean? There's no more sea. There's no more blocking between him and creation now. He can freely interact with creation now. It's no longer a closed system. He can add energy in. It doesn't matter if, if he dissipates, if energy goes away, if, if disorder comes. He can reorder it. He's the actor. He's the agent. He's the intelligent agent. For the new creation, there's no more C. There's no more C. Uh, what, what about for the city? What about for the new city? Why, why is the new, what about the new Jerusalem? Very similar. What? Keep going here. Um, 22, verse 20, verse, verse 23, Revelation 21, 23. Revelation uh, 21, 23. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did light in it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. The Lamb is the light thereof. He's the light source. He's the energy source. 
right? He's the source of work that's getting put into the system. He's the source of energy that's getting put into the system. City don't have to fade. The city will be there as long as my God liveth. He lives forever. Uh, uh, what about the new creatures? What about the new creatures in the new creation? The people in the future. What about them? Revelation 22. Revelation 22. Uh, uh, 22 and verse, yeah, 22 and verse 2. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river, and uh, there was there the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the, fr the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there was no more curse for the throne of the God, but the throne of God and the lamb shall be in it and his servants uh, will serve him. Um, let me see. So, so that tree there, you see what? That there's that tree there and the people were going to come into it, right? The people are going to come in and they're going to eat of that tree. They're going to come in and they're going to eat of that tree. Uh, let me see, 21, 24. Ah, oh, yeah, it's not here. But just trust me here, okay, right? The people are going to come in and they're going to eat of that tree. Now, what, a, what? how can you partake of that tree? Go to Genesis 3. How can you partake of that tree? They're going to partake of that tree and that tree is going to give them the life. But how do you partake of that tree? Genesis 3. Genesis 3. And I think it is... Yeah, verse 22. Genesis 3, verse 22. And the Lord God said... This is Genesis 3, verse 22. How can the new creatures... They're going to eat the tree of life, and the tree of life is going to give them eternal life. How can they, how can they eat the tree of life? What's the, what's the stipulation for eating the tree of life? Or what's going to happen when they eat the tree of life? Verse 22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and what? Live forever. So the tree, the tree will, will, then, will then get them that. And so, and so uh, what about it? Well, they'll be innocent, right? They'll be innocent. They'll be innocent. Why do you say that? Because it's implied there. It's implied there. Hey, now, now that they know good and evil, now that they have sin, let's kick them out. Because, right, they shouldn't eat it. They shouldn't eat of the, uh, of the tree of life. They're going to live forever with sin. But if they can eat, if in the future they can eat of the tree of life, then they must be what? Innocent. I don't know if I would say sinless because I'm honestly, I'm still trying to figure that thing out if in eternity there's sin. I know we teach that there isn't, but the more that I'm starting to study, I'm not 100% sure. But, of course, I'm standing on the normal teaching. But, but I can say without a shadow of a doubt that they're innocent. The sin isn't imputed to them. They're completely innocent in the, in the, in the eternity, and they're going to come partake of the tree of life. Um, okay, and then what about Christians? Christians, right, what do we get? 1 Corinthians 15, baby, you know this. You know this. You know why we won't fall into entropy? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. And we won't go any further. It shouldn't continue. So what, what is it? We're going to have an eternal body. Right? Because why? Because the reason we die is because of sin. Romans 5.12. The reason we die is because of sin. We'll have an incorruptible body, a body that cannot get corrupted. And so we can't, we can't die there. We can't die there. And then, you know, so we don't got to worry about, uh, you know, we don't got to worry about disorder, any of that messing the whole thing up because God's going to be involved here. So let, let's finish this whole thing off here. Just taking a look at some, what are some eternal things? Because a lot of them are spiritual. We live here in a physical world, and we're not going to be able to take many things into that world because what well, this world's going to get destroyed. But there's some spiritual things we could take into there. Okay, so let's take a look there. Because that's what's important. That's what's important. So let's. Um, yeah. Matthew chapter 19 and Matthew 25. Matthew chapter 19 and Matthew 25. We are making good on time. Praise God. Glory to God. Matthew 20. I hope this was, uh, was, was palatable. I hope you guys were able to understand this. Um, please, uh, you know, 
you know, don't chase me out of the place if you didn't like it. So. All right, Matthew 19, Matthew 19, and we will look here at Matthew 19 and verse 16. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16, the Bible says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Of the, of the 40, 47 references of the word uh, of uh, eternal in the Bible, 30 of those references are eternal life. 30 of those references are eternal life. And at 30 years old, the Lord Jesus Christ committed himself to a ministry to get you eternal life. Glory to God. Hey, amen. That's just free. Eternal life, right? Eternal life. That's, the, that's one of the main eternal things. That's one of the main eternal things. And, and as there's one word for what we're going to get, we're going to find out that there's many words for what the other eternal people are going to get. Matthew 25. Matthew 25 and verse 46. Matthew 25 and verse 46. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 46. The Bible says, And these, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into ever life eternal. Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. And verse 29. Mark chapter 3. And verse 29. The Bible says, but he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Eternal damnation. So we have eternal punishment, eternal damnation. There's another verse that says uh, uh, they eternally perish. Think about this, brethren. We are going to a place where we're going to eternally live. We're going to abide by in the light forever. And they're going to go to a place where they're going to eternally die, abiding in darkness forever. Right? Talk about your getting, getting your mind on heavenly places. You know what I mean? On eternal things. Getting your mind on eternal things. That the guy at the register who made you mad, he's going to die and go to hell. Maybe, maybe him messing your thing up isn't that bad. Maybe you should act like a Christian regardless. You know? Maybe put up with some, some punishment. Psalms 145. Psalms 145. Psalms 145, verse 13. You know, I, I, whenever, we, whenever I do a study on this stuff, I like to end it like this, right? Because, you know, it's so cool seeing all of this deep stuff, but usually the deep stuff has some milk. And it's usually some real convicting milk, just right at the bottom of it. You know what I mean? Right there. Right there, that'll just get you all messed up. And so it's good. We get encouraged. Hey, in eternity, we got some cool things to look for. We got some great opportunities. We got some, some you know, infinite possibilities. <laughs> Amen, right? We got all types of things that could happen in eternity. So let's work hard while we're here to get other people in there, to compel them to get them in there. Psalms 145, 13. Psalms 145, verse 13, the Bible says, Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. Another word for eternal here that you'll see in the Bible is everlasting. Be careful with the word everlasting. Everlasting, some of them, it means it lasts as long as the earth lasts, and some of them means it lasts forever. So just be careful with the word everlasting because it can have two definitions there. Uh, but this is one that's forever. Okay, uh, let's look here at another one. Matthew 18. Some, we're looking here at some things that are eternal. Some things that are eternal that we can deal with right now. You know what I mean? Like we can have an effect right now on some, on some, of, these, on some of these future things. I don't ever want to go to this place, but I, I hope I could stop some people from going to this place. Matthew 18, Matthew 18 and verse 8, the Bible says, Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot cut it off, or thy, offend, uh, thy foot offend thee, cut them off, and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Everlasting fire. 2 Thessalonians 1. 2 Thessalonians 1, just a good reminder, these things will last forever. You know, I don't want to witness to them, I don't want, you know, I don't, I don't want to sound stupid. These things will last forever. They'll go there forever, Christian. You'll never get another chance. You know what I mean? As, as you move, as time, move, as you move closer, as time approaches um, the speed of light, Time becomes infinite. 
As you approach the speed of light, time becomes infinite. So as you go the other way, time approaches zero in complete darkness. Almost as if time stops down there as well. What do they say? Uh, heaven will be eternity with Jesus, but hell will be eternity with uh, or hell will be eternity without him or something. Without Jesus Christ will be eternity for hell. You know what I'm talking about. Either way, whatever I said, if you got any conviction out of that, there, that's convicting. It's a convicting little statement I just said there, but I didn't say it right. Amen. Okay, praise God. Second Thessalonians, or Second Thessalonians. What did I say? Uh, one verse nine. One verse nine. And who shall be punished? Verse one. Verse eight. Well, let's look here. Uh, let me see. Uh, da, da, da. Verse 6 for context sake. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you and to you, uh, to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus Christ shall be received from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Now I know we should say glory to God for that because praise God, Jesus Christ is being exalted and all of that, but I don't want my family members caught up in that. I don't want people I know and love caught up in that. You know what I mean? Forever. Forever. Jude 1. No, let's go 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter 2, this is better. 2 Peter chapter 2, and then I'm, I'm almost done here. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 17. 2 Peter chapter 2. And verse 17, we're going to go up to... Uh, let me see. Son of Abraham. Worshiping... Man, it's the prophet. Ah, it's just verse 17. We'll just do it for the... Okay. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. Right? The mist of darkness. It's one, another name for, for the, one of the places of hell. We see in, in Jude, uh, Jude one thirteen that there's some, some angels reserved in everlasting chains of darkness down there as well. Right, so there's some eternal things. There's some all these things. Look at uh, Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. And uh, we'll just end it off here in a, in a good note. I know I took a little there. but Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 15 and verse 18. Exodus chapter 15 verse 18. Can I get someone to read this out for me, praise God? With a loud voice. Exodus chapter 15 verse 18. Someone, when you get to it, just read it out loud. Exodus 15, 18. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Woo-hoo-hoo! That's good! That's good! The Lord shall reign forever and ever. We're going to His everlasting kingdom. Don't worry about the disorder. Don't worry about things falling apart. Don't worry about any of that. We're going to a place that God has everything completely under control, even to the degree of time. Even to the degree of time. Where we're going to go, the most loving, benevolent, the lover of my soul, we're going to his house. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. All right. Praise God. Dear Lord, uh, just thank you, Lord, for uh, blessing the, the, you know, I got a blessing out of the Lord. I got encouraged, Lord. I get, man, I get, I get so motivated just, just thinking about this stuff, Lord, and just thinking about all the possibilities of, of where we're going, Lord, and, and just all the fun to be had, Lord. And um, Lord, just, you know, as we look towards that fun, as we look towards our blessed hope, Lord, uh, I pray, God, that you'd help us to also just keep our minds, um, you know, where our feet are stepping every day and, and the souls that we approach every day and um, the people that are on their way to an eternal punishment and eternal damnation in hell, God. I pray, Father, that you'd help us to be eternally minded, Lord, that we'd look, um, we'd, we'd look at these people and we'd have compassion on them, God. We'd have compassion on, 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 on the sheep who are without a shepherd, our, our, our brethren who have false pastors and, and just, uh, bad leaders for the lost souls, for everybody out there, God, that we'd really be able to just affect eternity, God, that we'd be able to just, just do something for you, God, that's going to affect forever, God. We know that in the ages to come that, you're gonna, that we're going to be able to show forth the, the exceeding kindness that is in Christ Jesus, Father, 
And I know we're going to be able to do all of that thing in the millennium, in, in eternity. We'll be able to just, you know, show the people how much you loved us, God, and, and, and our testimony forever, Lord. Um, and God, I just pray, Lord, that, that while we're still here on earth, Lord, while we still have a chance, Lord, that you'd help us to just, just, just submit to you, God, and just get whatever it is that you want us to do, Lord, whatever it is that you want to use us personally for, each and every one of us, Lord. Pray, Father, you just help us to submit to that, Lord, and, and to do it, God. I know you want to give us a full reward, Lord, and so, Lord, I just pray that you'd help us, Father, to, you know, to just be where, where it's right for us, God, and, and I love you so much, Lord. Pray that you'd help me to love you more, Lord, and help all of us, Lord, to trust you and to just, uh, just, just yield to you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen.